Mankind, for the most part of its existence, has pursued the ultimate weapon, from the early spear, to the bow, the trebuchet, the musket, the mortar, fat man, the hydrogen bomb, and finally the largest ever man-made explosion, the Tsar Bomber. The evolution of destruction led us inexorably down the path to a bomb that is too powerful to use in any combat situation, apart from when used in conjunction with the mutually assured destruction doctrine, aptly shortened to the term MAD. The weapon would acquire many names from Joe 111 to simply Ivan. Whatever name you give it, the Tsar Bomber being the name attributed to the West, is a testament to the acceleration of nuclear research seen during the Cold War. It showed the edges of what is humanly possible in the field of atomic weapons. So unpractical is an explosion the size of the Tsar Bomber that only one would ever be made and tested. During the first 15 years of the Cold War, both the USA and the USSR ploughed unbelievable amounts of money into their atomic weapons programs. In 1961, the detonation of the Soviet Tsar Bomber, officially known as RDS-220, was the culmination of an east-west arms race. The US had taken the lead in atomic weapons production in the 1940s during the Manhattan Project, causing a perceived unbalancing of power between the two superstates. With growing tensions caused by the building up of the US atomic arsenal, the USSR pushed on with their own atomic weapons test in 1949 with a bomb nicknamed Joe-1 on the steps in what is present day Kazakhstan. Achieving the hydrogen bomb in 1953, the arms race shifted into a more serious gear. For the most part of the 1950s, many countries sought to produce nuclear weapons with ever increasing yields. Numerous tests were carried out by the Russians, with 1958 seeing 36 devices tested alone. The increase of global nuclear activity took its toll on the environment. I have a couple of videos on that. Premier Nikita Khrushchev in a 1960 UN General Assembly made a promise to show the USA a Kuzkinomat, which roughly translates to a will show you. He spurred on the Russian scientists to create the ultimate nuclear weapon, intending to win the arms race and show Russian power, especially since only a few months before the Tsar Bomber, the US undertook the failed Bay of Pigs incident. However, the detonation of RDS-220 became a controversial subject, creating a larger arms race, as it was part of a number of tests that ended a nuclear memoratorium between 1958 and 1961. In a direct response to the test, the USA started detonating a series of bombs during Operation Dominic, adding further fuel to the fire. All of these events led the world to the brink of nuclear annihilation, as in 1962, the East and West stared each other off during the Cuban Missile Crisis. We were getting a little ahead of ourselves. This video is about the Tsar Bomber after all. RDS-220 was designed and built in 1961 by a team of physicists led by Yuri Kalitun. The team also featured notable scientist Andrei Sakharov, who was known as the father of the Soviet atomic bomb. The team also featured Viktor Adamski, Yuri Babiev, Yuri Smirov, and Yuri Tritnev. The weapon, believe it or not, was intended to be even more powerful than what we saw detonated, with a predicted yield of 100 megatons. This would have made the bomb impossible to drop due to any plane destined to drop the device wouldn't have been able to escape the blast, and the fallout would have been on a disastrous level. Instead, the decision was made to make a diet version yielding a mere 50 megatons, well in comparison to the original plans. To put it into perspective, Popular Mechanics made this illustration to show how big the Tsar Bomber was, having the equivalent explosive power of around 1500 times that of used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The actual test bomb would weigh in at a portly 27 tonnes, with a length of 26 feet or 8 metres. Part science experiment, part propaganda tool, RDS-220 was never truly intended to be used as a deployable weapon. The design consisted of a three-stage hydrogen bomb. Now unsurprisingly, I'm not a nuclear physicist, but I'll try and explain what a three-stage bomb is. The design is not used anymore due to size and weight requirements of modern delivery methods, as 27 tonnes for a bomb is a bit excessive. A three-stage bomb uses fission initially to compress a thermonuclear second stage. So far, it's pretty standard. However, the third or tertiary stage uses the energy from the previous stage to compress another thermonuclear stage, thus creating one massive explosion. To reduce the potential fallout of such a large explosion, the design's third stage used a lead tamper instead of the originally intended uranium-238 fusion tamper. 
the uranium would have greatly amplified the reaction by fissioning uranium atoms with fast neutrons from the fusion reaction. Due to the swap of uranium to lead, RDS-220 released relatively low levels of radiation for the size of explosion. The site for the detonation was Zone C of the Novaya Zemlya test site at Sukhoi Nos, a cape on the Severny Island. The Novaya Zemlya test site would see around 220 nuclear weapons tests since 1955. It was decided that the bomb would be delivered via a heavily modified Topilev Tu-95, which in itself is an impressive type of plane. The modifications consisted of having bomb bay doors removed, fuselage tanks removed, and painted in reflective white paint to reduce the risk of heat damage. This delivery method was chosen due to the device being too large to be deployed by missile, further proving the impracticality of such a weapon, as in a combat situation, the plane carrying the bomb could easily be intercepted. To give the plane's crew a hope to survive the blast, a 800kg parachute was attached to the bomb to slow its descent to detonation altitude. Even after the modifications, the plane crew of the Tu-95 were only said to have had a 50% chance of survival. Piloted by Andrei Donovsev, the Tu-95 set off from a runway on the Kola Peninsula, joined by a Tu-16 observer plane also painted in reflective paint en route. The bomb was released 30,000 feet over test site C, deploying the parachute as it fell giving both planes enough time to reach 30 miles from ground zero. The bomb was equipped with barometric sensors set to detonate at an altitude of 13,000 feet. On the 30th of October 1961, at 11.32am Moscow time, the altitude was reached, detonating the largest ever man-made explosion. The resulting yield was 10 times more powerful than all the conventional weapons exploded during World War II. Look at your nuke map, you can see the effects of the Tsar bomber if it was detonated over London. And this is the size of it in the 100 megaton version. Needless to say, one bomb would turn London into a glowing hole in the ground. A small village in Seveny, 34 miles away from Ground Zero, disappeared off the face of the map, with all its wooden brick and buildings ceasing to exist. Villages 100 miles from Ground Zero had their wooden buildings demolished, and stone and brick buildings saw heavy damage from the shockwave. Third degree burns could be experienced at a distance of 63 miles, and test personnel could feel the heat at a distance of 170 miles. The shockwave could be felt in Dixon, 430 miles away, and windows were shattered as far away as Norway and Finland, and seismic sensors registered the shockwave on its third journey around the world. The mushroom cloud reached 40 miles high, around seven times the height of Mount Everest, and the cloud had a width of 59 miles at the top, tapering down to 25 miles at the base. The plane delivering the bomb survived, barely outrunning the fireball. The British Foreign Office, Prime Minister of Norway, Gerhardsen, Prime Minister of Denmark, Kampmann, all released statements condemning the blast. The Tsar bomber hastened the end of atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, as many people spoke out about the risk of global fallout of any larger bomb. The worrying effects of such weapons convinced Andrei Sakharov to begin to speak out against nuclear weapons testing. He backed the 1963 ban of atmospheric weapons testing and became an open critic of nuclear proliferation. His outspokenness garnered him a Nobel Peace Prize in 1975, however he became a target for the Soviet government, resulting in him being internally exiled to the city of Gorky between 1980 and 1986. The Tsar bomber's fallout was not just radioactive, as the explosion demonstrated how far an arms race could develop, even to the point of creating pretty much a doomsday machine, much like the one described in the 1964 film Dr. Strangelove. Why didn't you tell the world, eh? The weapon did demonstrate the USSR's scientific achievements in atomic technology, but only went on to further build tensions between the East and West. Lucky enough, there are no weapons with a yield as high as RDS-220 today, as most modern day nuclear weapon systems only have a fracture of the power. Even still, they will spell the end of life on Earth as we know it. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. 
help the channel grow, please comment, subscribe and share all the videos. Also to keep up to date with new videos, hit the bell icon. I'm also thinking of changing my avatar, so if you have any suggestions, let me know down below. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.